Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew is a critically important gospel of the four gospels in that it creates the bridge from Old Testament religion, from the Judaism that we discover within the Gospels over to the church. And in a very real sense, Matthew is a Jewish Gospel. And as we step into that Gospel, it is in Matthew 13 where Jesus begins to teach in parables. And the first parable he gives deals with the criticality of faith. The great difference between the Old and the New Testament is that the Old Testament dealt with institutions, it dealt with a people, it dealt with a nation, it dealt with sacrifices, it dealt with physical objects, a country. But then when you come into the New Testament, you enter into the world of faith, faith in Jesus Christ, faith in his resurrection, and a faith walk. The first parable of all of the parables of the New Testament deals with this faith walk. It is central and critical. The great difference between the Old and the New Testament is that the Old Testament dealt with a nation. The New Testament deals with the individual who trusts in Jesus Christ, enters into the body of Christ by faith, and then walks by faith. Matthew chapter 13, I'll read that first parable. Matthew 13, 1. On that day... Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea. And great multitudes gathered to him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole multitude was standing on the beach. And he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them up. And others fell upon rocky places where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And others fell among the thorns. And the thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell on the good soil. Noble soil is actually the word he uses. And others fell on noble soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. First parable in the four Gospels on the criticality of faith and a heart's response in faith. It's the parable of the sower. And to appreciate the parable of the sower, we have to understand something about the difference between how they sowed 2,000 years ago seed and how we do it today. In Judea, the land was covered with rocks from limestone that sometimes was just a foot or two beneath the dirt. And to have a field to plow, they would take the rocks out of the field and typically they would pile the rocks and actually create a path that would be the border of the field that they would sow. So you would have the limestone boulders, rocks, pebbles being thrown onto a spot where you would have a path, a thoroughfare, going along the edge of the field. Then, instead of plowing the field first, the way modern farmers do, 
what they did was actually go out and scatter the seed, broadcast the seed without plowing the ground first. And they would go across the field just spreading the seed out, throwing it along the path, throwing it into the weeds, just scattering it everywhere. Then after it was scattered, they would plow and plow the seed into the ground. That has to be understood to appreciate what Jesus is saying here. After describing the parable, he then tells his disciples to them, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven are to be revealed, and he proceeds to explain this parable. Verse 18, hear the parable of the sower. And he begins to take every element of the parable he gave and compared it to the experience of the human heart when it comes to the exercise of faith. Verse 19, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom, God's reign over this earth, and does not understand it, what we realize that the seed is the truth of God, the word of God, and when anyone hears the word of the kingdom, God's word, and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom seed was sown beside the road, beside that pathway of rocks and pebbles and stones that created the border of the field. The seed fell on rocks and the birds can take it away. It's just out there on rocks itself. And he compares it to what Satan does. And what does Satan do? When the word of God is presented, inevitably, invariably, Satan comes and presents a lie, a counterfeit, a falsehood, that negates the truth of the gospel, the truth of the Bible. And the word that was heard is diminished by his lie. And so, in a sense, the word that was spoken just hit a rock, the rock of the person's heart. Then Jesus proceeds to explain more. And the one on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. There's dirt, there's soil that's mixed with pebbles. The seed is thrown on those spots. The plow pushes it under. And that Seen represents a person who receives the word with joy, yet has no firm root in himself. But it's only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, <coughs> immediately he falls away. And what Jesus is doing is actually describing conditions. The person who is lied to by Satan, the person who is pressured externally by problems, by persecution, and both individuals have the effect of the word pushed out of their heart. Satan and external pressures. Then Jesus takes a further step in describing how people respond to his word. And the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, and remember again, they didn't plow the soil first. 
they plowed the soil after the seed was scattered. So they would throw the seed right on top of thorns, presuming that in a few minutes the plow would go through and put the thorns and put the seed underground. And on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. Choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. He starts out from the outside and he talks about the influence of Satan. Then he talks about external pressures and then he talks about what goes on inside of us. What can choke truth inside of us? What can choke out truth? Plain old worry. A good worry can undercut a ton of truth. And Jesus says the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. Why the deceitfulness of riches? You could have a hundred million dollars in the bank and that secures nothing because disease, affliction, and death belongs to all of humanity. And riches will say you're secure, your life is solid, but the reality is no one escapes the problems of this life. And so the internal problem of what goes on within our own souls. And then finally, he comes to a healthy response. And the one on whom seed was sown on the noble, the good soil, this is the man who is hearing the word. The woman who is hearing the word understands it who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. The fourth one is the positive, healthy result. Now, what you have with the parables of the soil is what's called a metaphor. A metaphor is one thing that represents another thing. And our hearts are represented as dirt, soil, pebbles, and rocks. But our hearts are not ultimately dirt, soil, pebbles, and rocks. Because soil is inert. Soil can't do a thing. Soil can't think. Soil can't reflect. Soil can't focus. Soil can't meditate. And Jesus is using the picture of soil to talk about spiritual growth. But with every metaphor that you have, eventually a picture of something else breaks down. The soil, the dirt, the ground represents the human heart. But there is a vast difference between that soil and our hearts. Because soil is just inert. Whatever its composition is determines how it'll grow. But the vast difference between soil and ourselves is that we have the capacity to receive the word into our hearts and work with it so that it will produce 30, 60, 100 times more fruit than what the seed started with. In the book of James, there is a description of the word as implanted seed. 
And in James, it actually talks about what the individual has to do in order to get the seed of the word to grow. And in James chapter 1, James writes, Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the implanted word. It's an interesting picture. It's like the word of God is a seed that's put into our hearts and then we have to cultivate that word by what we do inside ourselves. And James says, receive that implanted word which has the capacity to save your souls. It can take you from earth to heaven. It can guarantee your future. It can justify you before God. It's a powerful, incredible thing. And it is our hearts that have to nurture it. And then he talks about what we do with this seed. He says, but you become doers of the word. And not merely hearers who are continually deceiving ourselves. He says, the purpose of the implanted word is so that it will be exhibited in life. It will bear fruit that will affect lives, that will lead to results, that will change the world around us. Then he makes a comment about an illusion that people can get themselves into. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face, the face of his birth, in a mirror. And once he has looked at himself and gone away, he immediately forgets what kind of person he was. And James says, when you hear the word, don't equate hearing the word with practicing the word. Never assume that information changes a life. But instead, cooperation with truth changes the life. A synergy with the truth. That's why the metaphor of the soil is not complete without James telling us what to do with that implanted word. And here's what he tells us to do. And it's really interesting what he tells us to do. He says, but one who looks intently that word for looking intently occurs three times in the New Testament. Twice in accounts where Peter comes into the tomb of Jesus Christ and it's translated as Peter coming into the tomb of Jesus Christ bending down because the entrance of the tomb was smaller than his height, bending down and staring where the body of Jesus previously was, and he's staring carefully at the grave clothes that were still wrapped in the form of a body, but no body was there. And he's staring carefully. And James writes, when you hear the word, bend down, look at it carefully, examine it, bend down and stoop and look. And what are you looking at? James says, at the perfect law, the law of liberation, the law of freedom, the law that breaks slavery. Stoop down, 
Look at the word of the New Testament. Look at the word concerning Christ. Look at the word of the Christian life. Stoop down carefully, look at it, and recognize that you're looking at something that as it's carefully examined brings freedom. It's the perfect law because it's the only law that doesn't punish but liberates. Stoop down. Take a look. How can you make your soul, your emotions, your heart a noble soil? When the word comes into your inner life, stoop down, look at it, realize what it is, the perfect law of liberation, and then remain around it, abide by it, stay around it. And don't be a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. And the person who stays around it, the person who examines it, grapples with it, integrates it into their life, Paul ends up by saying, shall be blessed in what he or she does. And the word blessed, marvelous word, it means that the person will experience the life of God in the here and now. And the worries of life, the assaults of Satan, the persecutions and problems of this world will have something that goes far deeper than those threats and those lies, the blessing of God himself. We're like soil in that our lives are intended to grow. We are unlike soil because we have to cooperate with the seed that's planted in our hearts, the Word of God. And that seed, that Word, is a word of liberation from the cares of this world, from the attack of Satan, from the worries of life. and from the power of sin. Our job, stoop down, examine closely, recognize the power of what's there, and remain around it in our inner life so that it becomes something that flows out of our life. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you that you're the God of the human heart. And we praise you that you've called us to freedom. Freedom from sin, freedom from this world, freedom from Satan, freedom from the flesh. And you have told us that we have a liberating word. And we would ask as your children that we would stoop down Look at it carefully. Recognize the power of what it is. And hang around it in our inner life. Father, for the person here who is not trusted in the gospel, may this be the morning when they believe that Jesus indeed did die for their sins, suffered for their wrongdoing, was buried and then raised by your power, with your stamp of approval on what he's done, and that he lives to bring home to heaven anyone who trusts him. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.